Hello and happy Friday. This is Susie Carpenter and we're here today to talk about being the hero and not the victim. And I'm incredibly grateful for this community, which uh, Jamie has introduced me to and to um, everybody who's been supporting me along the way so far in my journey. And uh, so today I'd like to just talk a little bit more in a deeper way about my journey and how I learned to become my own hero. It's actually the last chapter of my book as well is titled Be Your Own Hero. And it's something that I wasn't conscious of during the journey, but it's something that evolved over time and has sort of morphed or transformed the way I view the world day by day. So I think I'd like to start by the beginning, you know, when things were not so good and when it was not easy to be my own hero. So going back about, gosh, probably almost 20 years ago, I had two young children, babies practically, and I was addicted to sugar and I felt entitled to eat sugar, to eat pretty much whatever I wanted, although I was a healthy eater. And at the same time, was not a very happy person. I never connected the two things at the time, but, um, and I was never depressed, you know, clinically depressed, but I had this sense of, I would almost call it entitlement, of feeling the victim. So my husband worked long days, and I envied and resented that. And uh, the children, of course, were somewhat of a handful and became more of a handful when my daughter was diagnosed with autism. So in 2001, when she was diagnosed with autism, uh, things unraveled into a lot of chaos day by day. There were many nights, I'd say at least probably uh, almost every night, at least five out of seven, where we didn't sleep. She would sleep maybe two or three hours a night. So I was exhausted. I was addicted to sugar. I was resentful that this was happening to me, didn't know why, and wanted to get out, wanted to escape. So I ate more and more sugar to try to escape. And again, I was playing that victim role without realizing it. So my mindset was around this feeling of wanting to be rescued, feeling like I wanted that prince to come riding in on his white horse and take me away. And you know, I love my husband to this day and loved him then. I'm lucky that we have a strong marriage, but he wasn't able to help me. And really nobody was able to help me. I went to therapy. I had a strong family relationship with my parents, with my four sisters, but I felt so alone. And I didn't realize at the time that so much of that was because of my mindset. So how did I get out of this victim mentality? And, you know, how, how did I decide to not be in that place of wanting to be rescued and realize that I had to do something for myself to make the change? Well, really, it, it took time, but my daughter was the one who helped me to see it through her journey of autism and needing to eat healthier. So her little body at four years old was suffering from uh, GI problems, vomiting, diarrhea, and as I mentioned before, the lack of sleep. So what happened was we had to, we really, I felt like we had no choice. And this is where the determination comes in. So despite my feeling like I had been a victim all of my life, I always had this one quality that if you've ever heard of Victoria Moran, she's written on The Charmed Life and some other books. She talks about everybody has a free square. You know, in bingo, the center square, the free square. Everybody has their own free square. So what is your free square? It's something about you that always gets you out of the tough times, that you know, makes things easier for you, that helps you work harder, whatever it is. So for me, my free square is that I'm a very determined person. So when something happens to me, I jump into determination mode. So when we found out my daughter needed to um, change her diet, 
She also had celiac disease. So that was at the time something new that I never heard of. But so I jumped into determination mode, jumped into saving her. And uh, it completely shifted that victim mentality for me because I no longer had the time to think about myself. Spent all my time thinking about her and what I could do to make her life better. And then, of course, her sister life's better. So there was a period of time where I actually lost myself in the process. So even though I was being the hero, I was not in touch with myself. And that was for many reasons. That uh, it goes deep into the autism in terms of processing, how m- many people with autism have trouble processing language. So some aren't even verbal, don't know how to express themselves. My daughter does express herself, so we're lucky for that. But she couldn't understand language that was being spoken to her. So I had to slow down, say things very specific to mean exactly what I meant. I had to use first then statements all the time. So first tie your shoes, then you can have a glass of water. Um, you know, first go to the bathroom, and then we'll get in the car. It's things like that. So everything was shifting for me. Everything was shifting. And for my family. So um, what happened was I watched her change. I watched with the diet. I watched her mood change. I watched her sleep change. I watched her belly get better. And I finally began connecting the dots and realized, wow, like there really is something about this food piece. Maybe I need to start looking at what I'm eating and see if it makes a difference with my own health. And it was, that was a very, very pivotal transformative moment in my life. And I, I remember the day exactly. It was, it was a fall day. I was looking out the kitchen window and I said, I'm going to do this. And, you know, I say that because I was a sugar addict and giving up sugar was not easy. I mean, it was um, like, you know, breaking up with your lover. Um, So, and I, I I talk a lot about food because I do believe that for, for us, of course, it was this major part of our transformation. And I do believe that for a lot of people, they are, they're asleep to the fact that what they put in their body could be affecting their health and happiness because we sort of just go through day by day surviving we're not always thriving. So anyway, I sat there and I said, I'm going to do it. And I uh, first went gluten-free. Then two years later about that, made a stronger commitment to be my daughter's partner. And it was a diet that the doctor recommended. And we, it's called the specific hydrate diet. And in order to have this diet uh, promote healing in the body, which was our goal, You have to be 100% uh, with everything that you're supposed to eat and everything you're not supposed to eat. So you have to adhere to all the lists of the legal things and the illegal things. So I didn't start it until I knew, okay, this is, I'm going to be able to follow through because if I was going to do it, I was going to do it right. So I started it in January of 20, um, well, say 20, 2005. And the first two weeks were hell, and I thought, what the heck am I doing? We felt worse before we felt better. And then things started to improve, and we'd have these lights at the end of the tunnel where it'd be like, wow, I get it. So like, say I started at a, um, a pretty low level with my mood and my health. Every time I'd get a jump, 10 points or whatever, and then I sort of level off and then I jump 10 points and then I level off and then I jump 20 points and I level off and then I jump again. So over the first year, that's what happened. So the first week was the hardest. The first month was definitely difficult. Once we got over that, it became much easier. So there was a lot of fear around this change, right? Because I was the only one I knew doing this. I mean, everything had to be made from scratch, catch up. Um, almond butter, everything they wanted you to make from scratch so that everything was fresh, everything was organic, there was no additives, no preservatives, no sugars, no grains, no dairy. My daughter was allergic to eggs, so she couldn't have eggs. So it was very restrictive and it became, I became almost neurotic about it. And 
for a good reason, because at the time, if things were going right, then everything was beautiful. You know, she was happy. She slept at night. If she had something she shouldn't eat or missed, a, missed uh, you know, a, um, she was taking supplements as well, missed her supplement, she wouldn't sleep at night. Things would fall apart. So we had to be strict, and it was very obviously that we did. So anyway, I became neurotic, and then at some point, I would say it took a couple of years before I, I opened up to this freedom and realized that what we had done really was so transformative for both of us. And so this journey, you know, is this is in my book on the bright side. So if you really want to know more about that, for sure read the bright side but the bright side is more of a love story than it is a story about nutrition and transformation because all along there was this determination that i mentioned but there was also this sense of love i had to to love i didn't had to i wanted to love my family above everything else so if my friends thought i was crazy because i couldn't go out with them or they couldn't have me over for dinner or what have you because of the things i was eating I didn't care because I chose to love and I chose to heal my family. So once I got over that loss of being different and you know, making this choice that we're lonely and realized it was the right choice, then was when I stepped into that hero role and was like, okay, this is, this is what we do. So how do you how do you move through that fear? Um, you know, I think one of two. There was two big uh, influencers for me over time. I'd say one book that I read over and over and over and over again is um, the classic Marianne Williamson, "Return to Love," and she talks a lot. And interestingly, it's more of a Christian book. It's based on the Course in Miracles, and she talks about choosing love over fear, letting go of the things that, that make you stuck. Because fear serves to protect us, but it also serves to keep us stuck, right? So whenever I felt a sense of fear, I would try to overcome that with an opening, with some sort of thought that allowed me to open up to a... Um, you know, the energy of the universe, I like to call it because I literally can look out the window and feel an energy that I can grab a hold of and go, okay, this is bigger than me. Uh, so, you know, and, and choosing to love over choosing to be in fear actually does open up a much wider universe for you. So every time I experienced that, then I was able to build upon it. Another way is to focus on gratitude. So instead of focusing on the things that I couldn't do, I tried to always focus on what we could do, uh, what we can eat, what we can um, read, what we can talk about, what she can do, not what she can't do. Because with autism, there's so much, you know, delay. You know, they can't, you know, do math like another student in their class, or they can't tie their shoes. They can't. Um, handle the fire alarm that goes off. They can't tell time. She couldn't tell time for the for years. She couldn't look at a calendar and know what day of the week it was. So you try to tell a first grader it's time to go to school, and she has no idea what you mean. And she's running around the house grabbing at things, and you know, not eating her breakfast and what have you. So there had to be, you know, again, we had to get through those tough times, really, to be honest, before I could really. Um, appreciate the love but uh, I think it's still there it was always there it had to have been there because I never left right I never gave up so another thing about Marianne Williamson return to fear she talks about miracles and when she talks about miracles she talks about asking for a miracle so any of us at any time can ask for a miracle a miracle is simply a shift in our perspective so Marianne talks about it as a miracle being asking God, you know, to help you appreciate something from another perspective. But you can take that and put it into your own words and say, okay, I'm going to ask for a miracle right now because I need a shift in my mindset. I need a shift in my perspective. I want to invite more love, more 
happiness, more gratitude, whatever it is you're looking for to get yourself out of the funk, maybe feeling like you're in a loop, uh, feeling stuck. So asking for miracles is another way to get out of the fear. Um, and, and that allows, I think it incorporates this essence of, you know, getting out of your own head and surrendering to something that is bigger and stronger than you. When we get stuck in our own head and thinking we have to control everything and thinking we have to fix everything, it's a lot harder to get out of the fear and to move into the freedom that comes from the, the, the um, love. I use the word love pretty loosely, but hopefully you, I'm making sense. Um, so the surrendering and um, another part of it is letting go of expectations. I think that has to come first. So we all have expectations for ourselves, for our children, for our life, for our house, whatever, you know, we, things involved in our life. And those expectations sometimes can keep us stuck like fear keeps us stuck. So we sort of put ourselves in a, in a bubble that we think we have to be in when the reality is, you know, we can expand beyond that. And we could connect to places that maybe are completely unrelated to those expectations. And so um, there's a lot of, again, freedom that comes from letting go of expectations and learning how to tap into your own sense of power and your own sense of intuition that let that guide you instead of the expectation of I should do this or this is what people with autism do. This is what people who work in marketing do. This is what people who, um, you know, work in fashion do, you know, letting go of expectations to me is kind of thinking outside the box. And then again, tapping into your own sense of inner wisdom that's unique to you and, and couples with your own sense of passion. Like what is your spark? So you may be in that field, but what is your unique take on that? What is your spark? How do you bring yourself into that? And all of that helps to be the hero because you have you have become that inner power you've become one with that so um and another part of that is of course trusting your gut right trusting yourself and what's really cool about a lot of this stuff um is that it's contagious is that it's got a ripple effect right so when you're around someone who has that sort of pizzazz of feeling free to be themselves and they've let go and they're just whew, having a good time, and that could be, I mean, just, just their essence, um, then you feel that they've given you permission, right, to feel the same way. So I love that aspect of energy. And um, my daughter, I have two daughters. So one is um, 23 and the other one's going to be 21 on Tuesday. And the one who's going to be 21, her name's Kelly. She's the one in the book. And actually they're both in the book, but she's the one with autism. And uh, both my girls are very intuitive and um, prophetic and very thoughtful. But Natalie being the first child is a little bit more of a go-getter type A, work hard, had to have straight A's, all of that, you know, through school. And Kelly is much more about energy. And so she's actually taught me a lot. And she's allowed me to step into this hero role because of her acceptance of me as well. So, uh, you know, she's, a, she's evolved into this beautiful soul who I think she probably always was. But the autism was, was suffocating her. So, but my point was that... Um, you know, as a parent and as a leader, it's so important to, to, to lead from within, to lead with what you believe and your values are and to allow that to be. So um, instead of, you know, forcing your child to do something, lead by example, right? So that was the big thing for me when I decided to become her partner. I thought, okay, I can't just expect her to do this and nobody else in the house is doing it. I mean, she's going to feel so lonely and punished. And so that was a big part of it. And another big part of it was that I did want to do it for myself. But so that leading by example and, you know, what you want to see in the world is how you live your life, right? And to me, that's, a, that's how I've come to. So the combination of the mindset shift 
of the detoxifying my body through good foods and through functional medicine, which means I've consulted with functional medicine to get the, the right nutrients in my body. I've come to this place where I call it my Zen place, where mind, body, and spirit all come together. And in that place, it's very, it's very hard to be the victim because you've kind of, you've overcome. You've, you've come to this place of um, peace and clarity. So I'm super excited about the conference on uh, Wednesday next week because the topic of clarity is one that I'm very, very um, invested in and passionate about. And I think there's so much about that topic to learn. So I'm excited about that. So, you know, there's this combination of the, um, the mindset shift and then what are you putting in your body? How are you treating your body? Are you honoring yourself? And I, I like to talk a lot when I give presentations about sugar because I believe, you know, from my own experience, certainly being a sugar addict, that that was when I was the victim, right? You know, sugar was one of my heroes. It was one of the things I used to numb out, to feel pleasure, to escape, and it kept me stuck. There's no question it kept me stuck. And so while I feel so passionate about that, uh, I also appreciate that people, you know, I appreciate the seduction of it, having been there myself. So, but I feel that I'm remiss if I don't talk about the food piece because it is so empowering. And often we don't know how badly we feel until we feel better because we are in survival mode. So I invite anybody into that conversation beyond today. If you want to discuss it, you know, by all means, reach out and we can have a little powwow about your own life and um, relationship with food or sugar. But it's about the self-empowerment that comes from those choices, right? So um, I think with, uh, you know, any kind of addiction like sugar comes that sense of escape. And addiction is complicated. I don't mean to oversimplify it, but that sense of escape. And recently I've noticed it a lot in um, certain situations in my personal life where things seem, we're trying to sell our house. Luckily it happened quickly, but before we put it on the market, I thought, oh my God, what happens if our house doesn't sell? Because we had tried to sell our house numerous times before and it didn't sell. And I thought, oh my God, if it doesn't sell, what are we going to do? Because this is the right time. We're ready to go. And of course, it was the right time. We're ready to go. The universe, the stars were aligned. So the house sold in three days. But beforehand, I was in that element of fear and thinking out of control. This is out of my control. What am I going to do? So I say all this and I just want to you know, also say, of course, I'm human. <laughs> we're all human. And that the fear will come back up. And so how do you deal with that? So every day, I try to have a mindful, mindfulness exercise with myself, whether it's in the morning or in the evening or both, where I tune back in and check back in with myself and review those feelings that I'm having and sort of work myself through them. That to me is one of the best ways to sort of keep in that Zen place is sort of that visit time with yourself or whoever you visit with. I mean, if you visit with God, if you meditate, whatever you do. So um, this is, this is great stuff, and um, I'd love to get some feedback. If, uh, and, and if uh, Trisha, if you have anything you want to add or ask me or Amy, I thought that was a beautiful expression of your journey. And <laughs> thank you, and so so courageous. Um, just sharing all that personal backstory and history with what you went through and what your family went through is intense, and I think that. Um, when we're totally honest with ourselves, it gives us the opportunity to be totally honest with other people, which can then help and make a difference to, in their lives. So thank you for sharing all of that. I, I sort of knew some of that, but it was really quite um, beautiful the way you shared all of that, Susie. Um, and I just want to, you know, sort of um, make sure that I'm understanding clearly what you've shared with us, which is it's important to be the hero unapologetically. And mm. when fear is blocking your energy, you can't, you can't be active and be that hero. And that's why being a victim is passive because the fear is in your way and you can't actually move forward. Mm -hmm. And beautifully said. Yeah. 
I, I love that you added the unapologetically part. Yeah. Um, because that is a big piece of it uh, that I didn't realize. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. It's, um, I, I find it um, fun to talk about because there is this opening up and, um, you know, we all feel, I think, a little bit afraid of being vulnerable. And so writing my story, the memoir, on the bright side, uh, I, was, I was ready to go. I was ready to get out there. Um, and then when I was done, you know, two years later, the, then I thought, oh, my God, what did I just do? And the more people that have read the book and write to me, um, you know, just somebody just posted on Facebook last night about it. Um, the more I'm just amazed at the love that it spreads and, and how people feel permission to feel their own emotions and to get a little vulnerable too. So I appreciate your saying that um, because it's, to me, that's the greatest joy. I've heard, I heard several ideas for a TEDx there. <laughs> what do you think, Trisha? Which one stood out for you? I saw like quitting sugar is like breaking up with your lover. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Right. And uh, the whole point, the uh, whole uh, aspect of when you make a choice, you gain something, but you also lose something. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. What did you say, Susie? You said you had to mourn the loss of something at one point. Was it? Um, well, there was the loss of you know, autism in and of itself. Um, like in the beginning when she was diagnosed, there was my emotional state was, oh, this will get better. You know, kind of like when you have a cold or, you know, but an infection that might last a long time. You know, my, my thought process was, oh, this is going to go away. It's going to get better. And then I realized, you know, over time that no, no, this was not getting better. And no, this was not going away. This, this was not, there was no cure. This was lifelong. So again, that determination kicked in of, okay, well, this isn't going get, to gonna get better, but I'm not going to accept that this can't be the best it can possibly be. I'm going to work to make this the best it can possibly be and do everything in my power mm -hmm. to free her from the clamps of that awful thing that we had in the beginning and we're so lucky to have been past that. Autism is still a daily event in our life. There's still things that affect us on a regular basis, but it's nowhere near where we were. So my heart aches for the families that are suffering because there are so many of them. And my prayer and hope is that this, you know, that there is at some point um, more, because it's so unique, individual by individual, especially nutrition and biochemistry, and it's difficult to say, this is what you do and then have everybody do it. So like what worked for me and Kelly might not work for, you know, Mary and Lucas, you know, or somebody else. So it's difficult, but the acknowledgement that it's a factor and the acknowledgement that it matters and then trying to work through that and give it the time and honor. For example, with autism, there's a lot of sensory issues. So my daughter used to walk around the house flipping up and down the light switches constantly. Like it drove me nuts. She would like sit there and go up and down, up and down, up and down. She couldn't stand people talking because she couldn't process the language, but it was also sensory. She couldn't, you know, loud noises. She couldn't handle textures. She'd rub up against everybody and touch women's boobs and stuff. Like, I mean, she was very sensory. But what, what, she, and smells, that was the other thing, smells. If something smelled bad, you could not have the girl to eat it or go near it. And I'm talking extreme. I'm not just talking, you know, a little bit. But what changed that was, was getting her on the supplement regimen and, and changing her diet. We did OT, we did speech, you know, three times a week, both of them for years. Um, and we did ABA 30 hours a week in our home for years. And all that helped. But what really transformed her and alleviated a lot of those things for her was the biochemistry. So, um, you know, as complicated as it is, my hope is that there will be more attention given to that because these children are growing up and then they get reached 21 and they have no more services. So the parents are stuck caring for them 24 um, seven. That's a whole nother conversation. But anyway, so yeah, it's, um, it's an amazing journey. I'm just so grateful that people want to hear about it because 
you know, for so long we were hiding, you know, it was all we could do to just get through the day. And now, you know, there's enough awareness thanks to organizations like Autism Speaks and others. And of course there's this explosion. So it's more common if everybody seems to know somebody who has been affected by autism. So, um, you know, I'm incredibly grateful for all of the love and support we've gotten, you know, certainly with the release of the book and people's um, willingness to, to read the story. And, and like last night's post on Facebook, the woman said, it's a page turner. And I've heard other people say that. And that was one of my goals when I started writing was I didn't want to just write a book. I wanted to write a book that people would read and get something out of. And that was challenging for somebody who's not a writer, but it, it, um, it is a beautiful love story and um, invite all of you into it. So, yeah. And thank you so much for, um, again, all of your love and support. Absolutely. Yeah. So, did you, yeah. And I was just gonna say, did you have anything else? No, that was awesome. Okay. I was wondering if we could close with just kind of a list of suggestions. Sure. On a wrap up. So what I pulled out, and then you can add to my little list here, <laughs> uh, focus on gratitude. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good one. Make a decision. Yes. Um, own it. You own know? it. Own yeah. it. Um, what did you call it before? Unapologetically, Trisha well, that, said. That was her words. Yeah, that, oh. that was a great word. Yeah. Really good. Um, shift your perspective. Mm -hmm. Let go of expectations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What else? Um, Make the choice to love rather than be um, uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lead, lead by example. Yeah. Right. Aligning yourself with your own values, right? So when, when you know what is important to you and you're aligned with that, that's kind of goes along with the letting go of expectations, but then you're more, you know, in alignment with yourself and able to be in that position of power of owning what you believe and speaking it more clearly and, you know, spreading that message. It's really good. And no sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, so I'm gonna run a I'm gonna run a sugar detox because all, all these talks I have like I don't know how many events this month, so I'm like I gotta run a detox because and I used to do it for years, but I'm like there's all these people and it keeps coming up and you know my opening line for my talk was if your doctor said to you change your diet or die, what would you do? And this is a true story: a man who had cancer on his fifth cancer diagnosis goes to the doctor and the doctor says that. And so he did, he changed his diet. He's a famous chef. But when I gave the talk last week, I, a good handful of people in the room said they'd rather die. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've got some serious work to do here. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run a sugar detox at the end of May, like a 10 day, just a sugar free challenge. It's not gonna be anything heavy, but just a, like a fun, let's go off sugar. Of course, I'm not on sugar, but like I wanna be the leader, of course, you know, in the journey for people and, and uh, share. How to do that so yeah it's really good yeah Covered a lot a lot of great topics Susie well thank you for doing it I appreciate it yeah it's um, you know and I, I'm I'm pumped for some kind of TED talk for sure I know yeah there's a few in there there's a few in there yeah yeah all right so, so how do we how does everyone find you Susie susiecarpenter.com with a Z with the Susie with the Z Yep, S U Z I E. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and happy Friday. You too. Bye, everybody. Bye.